So we're here today to um, talk to Manu Batsano, um, and I'll go on to say a little bit about him in a moment, but he's a member of the uh, team for the Institute of Zen Therapy, um, and there are many, many ways I could introduce him, <laughs> um, and lots of different threads that run through your life, I'm sure we'll pick some of those up. Um, the way you introduce yourself on your website is as a writer, supervisor, lecturer in humanistic psychology and modern European philosophy. Um, and you're also a psychotherapist and you're also an ordained Zen monk. Uh, you're agreeing with all this so far, that's good. <laughs> and um, you were born in Calabria in Italy and Manu's also lived in Germany, India, America and came to the UK in 1990 and your history with Buddhism is, is kind of long and um, you've, you've studied with various um, masters and various disciplines and um, you're also very influenced by your philosophical studies in, in your background um, and some of the themes, I guess, that I picked out from your recent work were themes like masculinity, the demonic, the demonic um, doubt, um, not knowing, those kinds of things. So we may pick up some of those as well. Um, as we're here to talk about two aspects of you, which is you as a Buddhist and you as a therapist, um, I wondered if you might want to start by talking first a little bit about how your Buddhism affects your therapy practice and then maybe a little bit about how your therapy practice affects your Buddhist practice. That's a diff very difficult question because, mm. uh, well in my case, it's Zen practice first yeah. of all and Zen practice has no purpose whatsoever. Uh, it's a bit like play. You play, and you know that there are, when you play, there are, you know, there are collateral effects, mm -hmm. uh, as it were. There are good, there's a good outcome in play, but there is no purpose for that. But I know that sitting regularly, which I continue to do, has a, permeates my life, so it must have an effect on, on therapy. Mm -hmm. I think the one I can think of is gaining more of a sense of presence. It means that I am a little more uh, careful, a little more aware, less prone to uh, being carried away by thoughts or emotions and being present to what happens mm -hmm. in the so-called inner world and also in the outer world, so the world of the client. I would say uh, it can help developing a therapeutic presence. But I'm also a little resistant into what to categorize in this way. Practice Buddhism, practice Zen meditation. Then you will be a more present therapist. It sounds a little too formulaic. So I, mm -hmm. yes, that one of the possible, that's one of the possible outcome. But I, the main thing, the purity of practice, I think, is that it's uh, undertaken with no purpose in mind. Mm -hmm. as, it, as it would happen with play. So, yeah. uh, maybe a, another thing I could say is also, by practicing, I'm able to stay more with my own discomfort that I, I feel I don't have to reach out to somehow cover it or solve it, do something. I can sit with my discomfort. Mm -hmm. So if I can do that, then I can sit with my client's discomfort. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to rush in and fix him or her. So I'm, I'm interested in, in two things. Um, the, the idea of your practice not having a purpose um, and how that might be different in your role as a therapist. Do you have a purpose when you see clients? Yeah. 
I don't know if I do. Um, the mm. the the client would come with a certain distress, with a certain uh, state of incongruence, you could say, mm -hmm. and uh, the purpose can be there. The presenting issue, the idea would be that the presenting distress or issue might be. Uh, might find some kind of relief, might find some kind of uh, uh, resolved solution, etc. As long as the purpose is flexible, mm -hmm. as long as the purpose is flexible, uh, then it would be something like good ther therapy, in my view. Yeah. If, if the purpose of that ther of therapy is to uh, clearly defined, I think that would be problematic. Mm -hmm. It would be it would fall in line with the current um, mainstream view of therapy as a fixing tool mm -hmm. for people to be able to function and to go back to the assembly line or to go yeah. back to the reserved place in the traffic jam and. Uh, so in that sense, my view of therapy is definitely humanistic. Mm -hmm. It's more to open up the possibilities, explore the possibility, what it, possibilities, and also what it is like to be human, rather than having too fixed, too strict a purpose. In I don't know if it mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, and I don't know if there's something about. Um, remaining open to the therapy taking you where it needs to go rather than deciding beforehand what what's needed for the, for the yeah. therapy or what's in a way you could say time. seeing where the conversation goes yeah. like what we're doing here yeah seeing where it goes and that means i think that's quite important it means it, it no longer will be my doing or my or the, the client's doing it will be more the impersonal way in which the interaction goes. Mm -hmm. um, I, at the most, I can create the atmosphere, create the room for the guest to appear. But to claim that would be my doing, that I'm such a good therapist, I'm so present, I'm such a good Buddhist, that I can make things happen, that would be hubris, it would be an act of... Uh, arrogance. Mm -hmm. So it's about where the it, the conversation, the work itself is meant to go. So sometimes, like you were saying, yeah. it could be a, um, we don't know where it's going, it could be a surprise. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but sometimes that can be difficult for my clients, um, that they think they want me to know. Um, what we should be doing or where, where we're going. Yes. And that's a very delicate thing because if I, if you buy into that, if I buy into that, then I buy into a certain investment that I am as a therapist, as a practitioner as well, I am in possession of a knowledge uh, of a particular special access to truth that other people momentarily do not access. Mm -hmm. And that, again, would be an act of arrogance. Mm -hmm. So all, all I'm doing is uh, providing a space, mm -hmm. providing an atmosphere, developing, working, fine-tuning my own body-mind, you could say, so that I can have this presence. And then the work takes care of itself. Of itself. So the expectation of the, that the client might come up with uh, thinking I might have some knowledge, I might know, that has to be kindly, gently challenged. Because mm -hmm. they might be part of the problem. In the end it goes back to the person, to where the person is going. And even if the person is doing something destructive, is doing something wrong, um, 
is resisting, as some of the military language in psychoanalysis has, it, the resistance of the client. Well, then I'm reminded of Samuel Beckett. Who knows what the ostrich sees in the sand? Mm. Maybe the wrong behavior, the, the impasse the person is in, is teaching the person something, is maybe useful in the long run. Mm. It feels like there's something very important to you about the sense of um, letting go of any assumptions you might have about what's necessary or, or what might be helpful. That maybe, um, maybe self-harming is the most commas, healthy thing for a client to be doing at this particular point in their life. Uh, or, or, you know, that's, well, that's the... Yeah. There's, there's, we never know. Maybe you not know, harming. So it's what what's happening, and a non-judgmental attitude towards that might help. It sounded like you were saying that we might like to think we know what's best for our clients sometimes, but we never really know. Yeah, and that's the key, I think. Assumptions, bracketing assumptions, suspending assumptions. So that's where therapy and Zen practice meet. Mm -hmm. In practicing what the ancient skeptical school in, in Greece called epoche. I don't know why people say epoche, but I, I, I like mm -hmm. the Greek term epoche. It means suspending any theory about the world, any theory about others, about me, and putting it aside. It's a very hard practice. It's in doing it I realize how many prejudices I have, mm -hmm. how many assumptions, cultural, gender, you name it, age, whatever. And, and as we know, that was taken up by phenomenology, Husserl, in the 20th century. But something got lost, because the root of that is a healthy, radical skepticism. Not cynicism, but just putting aside any theory and going back to what am I experiencing this moment? Mm -hmm. What is the person saying to me? What is the body language? What, what goes through my whole body, mind as well? So it's an attempt at paying attention to phenomena mm -hmm. and bracketing assumption, including very sound psychological assumption, including very sound and uh, ancient and respected Buddhist wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to put them aside and look again, and look at the world again with fresh eyes, mm -hmm. uh, being a perpetual beginner. I mean, it sounds a bit grand, but all I'm saying is it's an aspiration, it's a practice to put aside yeah. and look again, put aside and look again. Something that you've said is that um, knowledge and expertise um, can be fetishes and um, I guess I'm thinking about that real pull that we have to know, to really know what's going on um, and how, how we can w resist that. Um. I'm reminded of the, the second thing I was going to reflect on when you were speaking about... Could I just say one thing about this mm -hmm. knowledge? Mm -hmm. What's the motivation for that? We want to possess knowledge because of fear. Um, and instead the idea would be to grow stronger in facing up to the reality of living and dying, which in Zen is, a, is one thing, living and dying, it's a constant happening. But sometimes we might want knowledge, even the no, a knowledge which is so thorough, like Buddhist kind of, uh, um, let's call it knowledge, or wisdom, in order to create a armor against the very rawness and suffering that life brings. Uh, mm -hmm. So knowledge is a fetish, it's also a 
could be a great uh, d defense uh, motivated by fear essentially mm. and, it, and it sounded like what you were saying earlier is that one of the antidotes to that fear that you speak about is to sit with it moment by moment and survive yeah and maybe even thrive and ride on it yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm reminded I guess of a word that I might use which you might not use which is faith right um, I do use uh, that word uh -huh. yeah, yeah. And, and, and would you use that word in relation to your Buddhist practice yes I don't know if you could say a bit more about that. A faith, in the way I understand it, in the Zen tradition, faith is trust without an object. So it's not faith in a deity, it's not faith in a person, it's not faith in one self even, because self is a very shifty notion. It is trust in the very process of life. Uh, somebody like Rogers would say trust in the actualizing tendency that is always at work no matter what's going on there's always something moving and something working towards the light you could say like a plant um, I said fa no faith in a particular deity but of course deity could be a symbol for the very process of life and death so <clears throat> I trust with no object, I, tr I trust with not in something in particular, the very process of life. And you could say the very process of life is a river, and we know that the river is going to the ocean, is going to, in a way, a kind of death. And maybe distress, pathology, the problems people experience, the problems I experience, is a way to say, stop the river. I want to have a little, uh, I realize that the river is going to the sea. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be part of that. I want to have a little hut where I can be safe from the elements. So in a way, our task as therapists, as Buddhist therapists, it's a very different one. It's almost pushing a person back to a stream of life which eventually will kill them. Mm. Don't know if it sounds but then harsh, they, but, but then they can be alive yeah. in a way that they can't be in the hut. Yes, yes, precisely. And, and I wonder if you would um, see our entire personality as the hut. Yes, personality and all the props. Mm -hmm. So, including the Buddhist props, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's another thing I wanted to mention before I forget. It, it's only through great faith, this great trust. The great trust will be the container that I can take, I can have the luxury to doubt. Mm. Because if I don't have the big container, then doubt is just uh, cynicism. Oh, I don't believe in this, I don't believe in that. It's mm -hmm. a, it becomes a kind of a self-defeating, whining, moaning, small doubt. You could call it defense. Or a way to assure that I'm not, I'm not participating and I'm not getting touched by life. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there is space for faith. Uh, only, only through having that faith I can say, I don't believe in this. I don't trust. I don't, no, I don't trust. I have a doubt and I want to inquire and I want to look closely mm -hmm. including you know the Buddha including uh, the Zen patriarchs including the great uh, all those great people who ins inspired us to you know I have to at some stage sooner or later I have to dare to doubt the Buddha mm -hmm. as well yeah. or whoever it might be that I'm putting on a pedestal because I have a heart on a good day, faith enough that I, I know that the doubt will not destroy me, but it will be a good mm -hmm. um, encouragement to inquire. Yeah. Yeah. I've been uh, reading um, 
uh, Karen Maroda's book this morning um, and she talks about how there's been a, a real resistance in the analytic world for, for a long, long time to thinking about the process of therapy as being um, a, a, a kind of an encounter between the client and the therapist and that the client is, is, is becoming uh, kind of sucked in and the therapist is too, that the therapist is in there as well. Um, and I wondered how much you, you bring your own vulnerability to the process of therapy. How vulnerable are you in the room with your clients? I think vulnerability is important and it's actually a better way, a better way to understand what in some circles now has become the sacred cow of authenticity, being authentic. Mm -hmm. I think vulnerability is a better version of that. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, I learned my lesson during my training when I had to work in placements with people with terminal illnesses. I realized that I was very moved, very vulnerable and very shaky in that situation. I also realized that everybody else in the client's uh, world was doing that. That I had, it was my duty to keep a steady um, presence solid presence. So, vulnerability, yes, acknowledgement of my vulnerability, but also a strength and a certain solidity. Also, I guess, in order to avoid what's also becoming a trend in, in contemporary psychotherapy, a misunderstanding of that good mutuality that you mentioned, that goes into merging, into a kind of platonic desire for a lost harmony where me and the client become one. That's a dangerous thing, I think. Mm -hmm. And you find a lot of uh, misinterpretation of Buber, I, Thou, or people like Levinas, particularly humanistic. And I also would say the intersubjectivity from psychoanalysis. It, it, it tends now, after a long stress into the, you know the, the the analyst is detached and is not there into joining in, but it's more and more veering towards fusion, emerging, mm -hmm. and we have to be careful. We don't want that to happen uh, because we need a level of impersonality and we need a level of vulnerability and involvement. So how to manage it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have no idea how therapists. They must have other, other you know, uh, tricks up their sleeve. How do they manage to do without having a practice? Yeah. You know, practice seems to be very important to keep all of those things in check. Mm -hmm. I want to remain human, I want to be vulnerable, and yet I have to keep one level of impersonality mm -hmm. so that I can be of use. It's a, a constant balancing. Yeah. Uh, 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 and the other thing I think that Maroda talks about is um, that we often think about the client as wanting to seduce the therapist psychologically. Um, so the therapist will like them or will, will do what they want them to do, but that we don't think so much about the therapist seducing the client, wanting to psychologically seduce the client. Um, and, and again, there's that paradox of kind of being in and also out, which makes me think about boundaries and what you were saying earlier. Um, in some ways, you bring no expertise to the space, but in other ways, you, you have a great deal of expertise. The expertise, that's the aspiration. I'm not saying I'm doing mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I'm aspiring to to wear the invisible garment, uh, Rogers will call it. The expertise will be so refined and so practiced that it doesn't feel like I'm some kind of mind doctor trying to help you. Um, so that's the aim. And I'm not familiar with the author you mentioned, so I'm not sure mm. 
or where it is coming from. But I, th I think it's uh, how how to keep the contradiction, how to keep the balance rather, mm -hmm. vulnerability, being human, which is something that help will help the person at the same time. Caring and not caring, I guess it is. Caring and not caring. Mm -hmm. Caring too much, then the problem is I would become invested in the person doing what I think is doing well. Mm -hmm. But how do I know mm -hmm. what doing well means? Mm -hmm. Some people need to do certain things which maybe are considered not so good. Maybe they need to experience what... Uh, you meant you referred to before as the daimonic, mm -hmm. for instance. If I'm just being good because I cannot be bad, I'm not able to be bad. You see what I mean? Uh -huh. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about was this concept of ordinary mind, the Buddhist concept of ordinary minds, and I don't know if you could say a bit more about about what that is and how it works in therapy. Well, there's a there's a famous Zen saying, mm -hmm. which is ordinary mind is the Buddha. Mm -hmm. uh, don't look for the Buddha anywhere else. Uh, you know what is enlightenment? The master answers. I think it was Joshua answers. Did you have your, you know, it's a famous, did you have your lunch? Say yes, then wash your bowl. Which could mean, first of all, look at ordinary life, be present, be, as the fashionable world has it, mindful. But also it means, did you have your lunch? Did you have your experience in meditation? Yes, now forget it. Uh, go back to whatever we do. In my case, doing the accounts, uh, you know. Uh, the boring things, paying the bills, but also the good things, swimming, or whatever it might be. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's the saying. On one level, it's, it seems to be used in Zen to to bash on the head the novice who who is after some kind of numinous, technicolor, uh, digitally enhanced Buddha. So to bring it down to ordinary life. That's the one thing. The other, I think it's a little more subtle. What, what do we do when we practice? When we sit? By that I mean sitting zazen in my case. Um, do I try to, again, bash, kill manifestations? For example, a thought about wanting to have a glass of red wine. I wanted to have wonderful sex, or or wanted to be on holiday, or whatever. Or do I consider them as also a manifestation of the Buddha? Mm. And and then how do I engage with all of that? Am I do I have a dialogue with those kind of thoughts, desire, things that that uh, constitute ordinary mind? Or am I seized by them, and I have no freedom? With them. So I mean, I don't claim to have the answer to that, but it's a very profound statement. Ordinary mind is the Buddha. It means, to me, it means where else would I be looking for the Buddha? What else? And that ties in with uh, a practice like phenomenology. It's everything is manifested already in the world of impermanence, in the world of becoming. It's not the Buddha, the meaningful experience, is not transcendent. Something about grounding um, the ineffable here yes. in our lives, here yes. in our daily lives. Yes. And, and having an experience of it through our daily lives. Maybe. Yeah, and, and practicing in, I guess, clearing <clears throat> the perception, being more attentive to what's already there. Because what's already there, 
how can I say it better than Hakuin? This very body is the Buddha, and this very earth is the lotus paradise. If we think the Buddha and the paradise are somewhere else, then we would tend to denigrate our experience. So even my depressive state, my elation, my problematic bits, the boring, are also very interesting and manifestation somewhere of the, let's call it the Buddha. Uh, so I guess everything is geared towards more and more, you mentioned Maizumi Roshi, one thing, appreciating this life as it is, as the manifestation of the, the life of the Buddha. So we are all acceptable exactly as we are? Yes. And um, we have to work hard yeah. at that recognizing that. And, and that reminds me of the quote by Suzuki Roshi, uh, something like, um, you are all perfectly acceptable as you are, and you could do with a little work. And that paradox. Uh, and as therapists, I guess, we are saying to our clients, you are perfectly acceptable as you are. And? Is there an and? In your work as a therapist? Yes, and I hesitate. <laughs> I don't think uh, we like ourselves very much. So, even to come to that simple state, to fully accept mm -hmm. who I am, it's a lot. It's a lifetime mm -hmm. of work. More than one. So it is a contradiction, and and uh, Zen practice is contradictory. It's contradictory. Becoming actually, let me think. Two of my favorite Western philosophers are very close to this. Nietzsche would say, "To become who you are, you mustn't have the faintest idea who you are." Mm -hmm. And a more contemporary philosopher, Deleuze, says to to ask the question, "What are you becoming?" is the most stupid question you can think of because we have no idea but so the acceptance is uh, it's very hard um, I think maybe maybe it's just me and that somehow we wouldn't be in the therapy room we wouldn't be doing therapy if we didn't believe in the capacity for things to be different for the client that's nice it's a nice... Uh, and also, yeah. things are okay. It, it feels difficult to hold those two things together. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a little, I'm a little lost there. Mm. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure where you're going with this. No, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I kind of lost a bit uh, yeah. the thread for yeah. a moment. Yeah, it, it feels like a paradox, I guess. Yeah, it is a paradox. Yeah. And there are many paradoxes. In, yeah. in Buddhist and therapist yeah. practice. You could say, if we go back to the beginning, say meditation is like play, mm -hmm. and the more I play, the more I fall, I seem to fall, one seems to fall, into a sort of a acceptance of what's happening, that, that there is no big gap that I have, there is no sense of some other person I have to become. There is less a need of, as fame again in the Zen uh, saying, don't put another head on top of your head. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, it's paradoxical, but it's only paradoxical to our mindset, the way we've been educated, that something is done for a purpose, and it's all that, and in order to become almost someone else. Mm -hmm. And things that I have, the natural things I have, somehow are not okay. They have to be discarded. And here I think the work is paradoxical in that sense because uh, without those imperfections, without the weed, a little bit of weed makes the garden more interesting. So gardening 
is another way of com maybe looking at this whole thing. What style of gardening you you like? I'm terrible at gardening. <laughs> I'm thinking that as we speak, um, we can lose sight of the human, the human relationship. Um, and I guess the word that keeps coming to my mind is love. I wonder where love fits for you in your practice. It's got nothing to do with love. Your, your therapy practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think love is a loaded word. And I think the respect for the autonomy of the other mm -hmm. is more important than love. I, I feel something from you that's, that's something about warmth. And I, I guess that that is present in your therapy sessions as well. I wonder how you would speak about that. Oh, want is fine. Empathy is fine. Uh -huh. Unconditional positive regard is fine. Uh -huh. But love is problematic. Uh -huh. Love is problematic because love from Plato onwards wants union. Love wants union with the beloved. And therapy is about separation. It's about a deep respect for the otherness of the other. So could we use the word, I don't know how to pronounce it, is it agap, agape, agape? No. Again, that's a Christian, originally a Christian concept, and it tends towards, I have a lot of time for that, in fact, um, for the ecstatic, for the merging, for the Dionysian, for the agape. Yes, I have a lot of time for that. But, if we're doing therapy, some of that, I think, I know this might sound controversial, has to stay outside. Um, has to be acknowledged. Transference, counter-transference, the erotic dimension of love is very important. But in the end, if we, we have to be aware of the philosophical root of that, Love, maybe, 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 you know, I don't agree with that term. Love wants union. And that belongs to a different dimension. Therapy, if we introduce the desire to join, and if we introduce union, therapy becomes problematic. And you, of course you could say, the respect for the autonomy of the other is a form of love. And could you say more about otherness? otherness? Otherness. Okay. Yeah, this is an important thing because I also uh, mentioned in my book, Spectral the Stranger. Otherness is not diversity. Otherness means, first of all, briefly, there's a, there's a poem by Rimbaud, actually not, in a letter, Rimbaud, a French poet, writes to his friend, he says, Je ai un autre. I is another. So I am a stranger to myself. No matter how much I will meditate, work on myself, there will be a large part of what I call me, the experience of me, which will become always an, a mystery, unknowable. So otherness is in me. Second, otherness is in the other person. 20 years of marriage, you wake up get up in the morning and say, who, there is a sense sometimes, who is this other person? But in a positive way. The sense that I cannot apprehend, know, possess this other person. It becomes, it stays a mystery. He or she stays a mystery. And so in therapy, the same thing, a respect for that. And third, the other is the person onto whom we project our disowned parts. And in this day and age, in the days of the Buddha, was the, the beggars. To become a follower of the Buddha, you'd be a homeless person. In this day and age, is, I think, is the figure of the migrant. 
the gypsy, the illegal migrant, is the person who gets uh, at the receiving end of our negative projection. So how do we respond to that? So respect for otherness has many implications, including political. Can we truly respect otherness and then go around uh, waving Union Jacks or, or, or Italian Tricolores flags? What are the implications for our sense of identity? So I think it's you know it's really I've just sketched mm -hmm. some but I think the implication otherness is something finally I would say otherness is the one thing that I the self can learn from. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for answering my questions and what's been interesting about the conversation for me is how. I guess in some ways we've mirrored um, a therapeutic encounter where the conversation has taken us where it wanted to go um, as well as us having our own agendas and, and wanting to, to bring particular things. Um, so I'd like to thank you for your time this morning and for um, sharing the things that you've shared. If you are interested in learning more about Zen therapy or about Buddhist approaches to, to therapy, do get in touch with the Institute of Zen Therapy. We've got a website, we've got a mailing list, and we run um, days and weekends in London for anyone who's interested in, in anything we've talked about today, and anyone who works in a therapeutic field or who's interested in Buddhism. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.